Thank you very much, Sean. Um, I'm talking here with two hats on today, um, talking about two projects that have been done. One looking at Invergordon in World War I, which is initiated by ARCH. And the second one, and this is the continuity that you were talking about, Susie, they got hooked at the beginning, wanted to keep going, and then Invergordon took on the impetus to Invergordon Museum to then run looking at it in World War II. For those of you who don't know where Invergordon is, um, we're here looking at, into the highlands at Inverness, and we're looking up here, it's on the Cromarty Firth, and an area there just towards the end um, of, on the north side. It's an area here we're looking, this is Invergordon that we're looking at here. This is the entrance from the Firth, which are called the Suitors. And the reason why it was important there, and the reason why it's important to the local economy now, is it's very deep anchorage. This is why the cruise liners can get in here, where they can't get many other places. It was why the fleet could get here. So it's sheltered, it had very deep anchorage, and it was hooked to the railway line. All three essential, essential things. So just setting the scene briefly, what do we have here? Well, before, even before World War I, the fleet is coming up here. It's a very active area. But in World War I, it suddenly skyrockets into a, a military area. We have here the suitors, the bits that guard um, the entrance to the Firth, which Alan has looked at quite a lot as well. Invergordon itself, the port there. We have a little bit further, Dalmore, which is another area I'll be talking about. Um, we have up here, an area, Nig, which had um, a number of army bases as well. And on this side of the Firth here, we have Cromarty, which was very briefly in World War I, one of the first seaplane um, bases that was there. World War II, this whole area is immediately just taken over again. So it's the North Shore is just chock-a-block full of military installations, mainly airfields. We have the Army, the Navy, and the RAF all active there. We have a number of guerrilla units that we're just starting to find out more. And in both World War I and World War II, this is a restricted zone. If you wanted to travel here, you needed to pass. It was very highly militarized. So before, as we said before, in World War I, it's the reason why this was developed over and above, perhaps otherwise, was Winston Churchill championed this as being the good place to basically become the fleet. And they realized at this point that they were going to need oil because as many of the ships were now starting to use that. So by, even by 1913, before the war started, there were 10 huge oil tanks and then another 31 done. So we have these 41 tanks, which bar one, are still there. So it's a remarkable preservation to still have that many World War I tanks that there. From 1912, you've got a permanent presence of the fleet, of the fleet there. But even before this, this is the second edition Ordnance Survey map from 1904, I believe it is. And already we can see why the fleet liked this. Because we have here a railway line, that's our main line going north, but a branch line that came all the way down along the shore, continued along the shore, and went right into these two really large buildings. These were the bone mill, the bone mill for making fertilizer. But already you have large warehouses where you can get a railway line in. And for some place that wants to be a place of repair yard for the fleet, this was ideal. It had, so it had that, it had two piers already, it had a bathing station, so your troops could have a little bit there. It had a lot of the infrastructure already to start. So our main sources for World War I are remarkably a lot of them. Um, military plans, naval plans, there's a large number of these still surviving. Some of them are in private collections, and those private collections keep getting, we keep finding people who tell us more about these. So they never underestimate the ability to come up with new information. Military documents from down in Kew, lots of postcards. This is supposed to be news blackout, but because there were so many troops there, we find there's a lot of pictures that were taken and then the postcards are sent. And so some of our information about sites is coming from these postcards. The bottom picture there is an aerial photo, which is extraordinarily early. It's probably just after World War I, but for an aerial photo, that's remarkably early to have. And we have got so much information just by zooming into that one. There are some published accounts, and I have to say one of the best ones we have was done by the local primary school. In the 1990s, the local primary school with a good teacher just set out interviewing, getting old photographs, putting it together, and we still find that that's one of the best sources we have. And for anybody who's interested in railway history, it's on the internet. It's Edwin Pratt's book about 
um, the railways during World War I. Fantastic resource that tells you a lot about what's happening. Two sources that I hadn't really considered before we started that we have found so much useful information are the valuation roles because the military is taking over buildings and so we find out which buildings they're using and the newspaper accounts. Now you wouldn't have thought this is not supposed to be in the press but it's especially just after the war ends. As they're cleaning up the place we find out a huge amount of information. So in World War I, Invergordon is a naval repair yard. It reclaims a lot of land. It, this is the, what it looked like in the second edition. And they bring in a lot of soil and reclaim that. The Navy naval yard is what most people heard about, but we also found that there was a large army presence. Here's one of our postcards, and those are army barracks that are there for about 2,000 men. So there was an army presence as well. If you have a very large naval um, institution, which we did, that requires a lot of superstructure and infrastructure. It needed a new pier in order to get the fuel for the ships. It had two hospitals, a small one, and then they quickly realized they needed another one. Because it's not so much for the people dying there, it's the casualties are coming off the ships and are then being taken by rail to the main military hospitals. Of course you need water. The town minutes, another good source, are full of talks about how we can actually get enough water here. And what do we do about the sewage? So you have all these infrastructure issues. The roads need to be surfaced. Pavements need to be done. Um, you need to have something to do with the troops while they're there. So we have actually three YMCA's. There's a YMCA. There's an American YMCA, because of course they had to have their own separate one, and a YWCA. So we have, also we have um, the YMCA could fit 2,500 people coming in. We have three cinemas. We have theatres. You have a whole community that suddenly skyrockets. The oil tanks as well, um, very, as I say, very well preserved. Um, even with their pictures show their camouflage paint. Think about it when you, you have a population that starts from about 1,100 and then goes up to 20,000. What that would do to a community. All these people had to have places to stay. And so we have some of them here. We have military plans which show the hutments very much like the barracks that you were talking about. Um, and we have pictures of the barracks with some of the men who were in those hutments. We have dock workers who are there who need their own housing. And there were 126 houses that were built, meant to be temporary, and people are still living in them today. We have, of course, officers' houses. They couldn't stay in these. They had to have their own, and there were six very posh houses, which are still in existence today. So we have lots of housing and lots of accommodation issues. We have businesses that are taken over, the bakeries taken over, um, the butchers, all of these issues of how do you get the food for the people. But one of the most interesting things about these workers as well, as our photographs are showing, is not just men. There's women. The top picture are the machinists in 1917, and you see they're women. The hospital, the second hospital built towards the end of the war, was built uh, reputedly by women. This, in a highland society, must have been absolutely radical. I um, mean, this is a society that was complaining about um, building and things happening on Sundays. And to have women doing all these activities must have been a huge social change. The houses are taken over. Church halls are taken over. We can chart a lot of this. And then, of course, in 1918, we have the US Navy coming in late to the war. But just to the west of Invergordon, at Dalmore, they're starting to assemble mines. It's one of two places in the Highlands where mines are being shipped in and assembled and they're taken over. In both cases, they take over distilleries, which have a logistical problem on what you do with the whiskey. Of course, there are lots of stories about not all of it getting put into the storage it was supposed to go to. More railway lines linked. Huge amount of um, changes that way. And also uh, the stories about um, what the Americans got up to. Surprising amount still survives. Um, we went through, we, of course we were lucky, we had all these plans. We had plans that had annotations and keys. So we were able to go and look at places. This here, a local inn, is the YWCA. That is one of the hospitals, which has now been converted to flats. This is the generating station, which still survives with some of the original war fencing. This is the pre-World War I bone mill. And um, picture that, because actually, after we did the project, most of that's gone now. It just shows you, with these things aren't listed, how fast they can go. 
And a nice little find here, um, that's a bit of the railway line that still survives on one of the concrete bases underneath one of those, those lines that went into the buildings. So we took our plans, we took what we went on the ground, um, and we created, um, took a modern map, and we put all of this into a GIS database. And that was really useful so that we would be able to basically do our overlays, modern with what was there before. And the dark blue, this has gone slightly distorted, but the dark blue you can see there shows the ones that still survive, the light blue what's gone um, for the World War, World War I buildings. Quite a lot surviving. After the war, the Invergordon remained as a fleet repairing briefly, but in 1919, the yard shut. And then, so what do you do with everything? Well, they basically disabled the guns and got rid of them. They sold off the hospital to the local health board. These cottages that we saw for the dockyard housing was private housing. Hutments were sold off, and we can track a few of them going to various farms. But basically, it reverts back to this small sleeping community. But with a bit of an exception. There's obviously in the 1930s the realization that things are going to be hotting up again and a new tank farm is built with more oil tanks there and further expansion of our existing tank farm. And between the wars, of which I won't go into, we had a small mutiny that caused national reper repercussions there. World War II, um, slightly different situation. Certainly um, Invergordon is not as important in World War II. The Navy is there, but they're mainly re just refueling and have a firefighting instruction. It becomes a transit camp for the Army and with a new base there, and they're tasked with guarding the port as well. But it's mainly the RAF who come to the forefront here. They have a seaplanes training unit and an air-sea rescue unit. It's seen as a vulnerable point, and the documents in there say the port will be defended to the last man and the last round. So you can see the importance that it was thought so our sources that we had for World War II are exactly what we had before, but in addition we had the memories. And this is why I agree with Ellen that we should, this is where we must be putting our emphasis now, is getting these memories before they're gone. It was so important to get the people who knew about this. Um, we have, having gone all the way to London to find plans, we then discovered some were sitting in Inverness very close to us, because they were filed under the borough documents. And so this is why sometimes things can come out in different ways. We found a wonderful annotated plan of the dockyard area for World War II that was on somebody's wall. It was a private collection. And because it, when, the, when it was um, being taken down, he picked it up because he didn't want it to go in the skip. And so he's now given that to the museum. So you can find these things still around. Um, the Invergordon Gordon Town Council minutes have been a wonderful source as well. Things that you might not necessarily expect to look at. We have another large influx of troops and another problem where to put them. So what they do this time is almost every memory talks about people getting billeted in the houses. And we have new camps. So we have a, a camp built there. We have inside the school playing ground, they built another camp. They're building extra. We have another RAF camp built here. So they're starting to infill, but basically they're still struggling. To be defended to the last man, well, there are pillboxes. We know by memory there are some. We have three surviving, and so we were able to, certainly there would have been a lot more. Rail blocks, just near the railway line, the remains of that. And this is not in Gordon, but just to give you a picture about what rail blocks would look like so that they could stop the main line. Um, Roadblocks. Our documents talk about 27 roadblocks in Invergordon. We found about seven of them from aerial photos and memories. There's a still a lot more to find. And flame traps, really nasty bits of defenses. Again, just basically barrels of oil, pretty much, that could be lit up in case. The real fear in the Highlands was that we were going to get invaded from Caithness and come down, and they would have to stop. This is one of the places you would want to stop everything. Gun emplacements, we have two very large anti-aircraft emplacements on either side of Invergordon. Today they are just fields, but the aerial photos, thank goodness, give us a really good idea of the gun emplacements and the Nissen huts for the accommodation. This one interesting, women were serving in there in the ATS. And our plans sometimes, this here on the shore says Gunport, so we're given sometimes information about where they're located. 
wonderful picture from 1941, um, just after Tank 13 got bombed, right there, um, because it shows here the barbed wire fencing in the snow. So we can see where the defences were and how they went and where pillboxes would have been. Air raid shelters, of course, they're both large and small. Um, an example of a large one that extends that whole distance there. This one is the inside for the ones behind the officers' housing. Whether that goes back to World War I, I don't know, but it's certainly the officers had to have their own as well. And we know from town documents that we have 450 Anderson shelters for the population that are distributed within the town, now used as sheds. Surviving remains, again, we still have a number of World War II surviving remains. This is Alan contemplating a Nissen hut here, thinking, is it going to survive another winter? And I don't think it is. Um, we have little bits of these for the fire tenders that are there. Some of the buildings near the piers still survive. And again, we have the plans so we can tell you what the functions were of each of these ones that survives. We have some accommodation. This is where the Rin stayed. This is one of the army camps, the base of the ones there. Fencing, gates, headquarters where the RAF and the pigeon house was, um, storerooms and decontamination units. A wonderful bit here is our, one of our oil tanks, all coated in bricks, and those bricks have all been dissolved. But we also have the underground oil reservoirs an inch and down. And this is a woman in her 90s who came to our sessions who had actually served. She had served there and was one of two women at the oil reservoirs, had never been in, and we got her inside the inch down oil reservoirs to see where she'd been working all those years ago. So the value of all these community investigations, even for World War I, it's amazing how much can survive. And that without having local knowledge, we would not got anywhere near as far as we did in terms of plans, in terms of information, even for World War I. The photographs and maps we found a lot from private collectors. The memories for World War II were absolutely essential. And the fact that these buildings are disappearing. Here we are with the schools, looking at some of the buildings for the uh, bone mill. That's gone. That just went last year because it wasn't listed. Output's really important that you have. A project like this, you must get your information out. So for World War I, we added 300 sites to HER and Canmore. We created a trail leaflet, so all these tens of thousands of visitors who come into Invergordon can have a trail and look at some of the remains. We create binders of information that go into the libraries and go into the museum. And we've done a geocache, which is incredibly popular, and get some of these people in. World War II, we have a brand new ex ex exhibition. We've just published a booklet which summarizes everything, which is, again, you can see this on the arch stall, over 700 records in HER and Canmore, and again, more binders. So it just shows you the wealth that a community project can do on this, and it's thanks, again, to all the funders, to Alan for his help, but most of all, to all the participants who took place. Thank you. Thank you.